After her conversation with Diana, Florence received an unexplained cash settlement. Now that Florence had $50,000 in her bank account, her husband was back in the picture. Of course, because that's what dead nigga mattresses do. They reappear when they see, you know, a possibility of a lick. Hello there love bugs. Hello there Bellas. If you have not already done so, please remember to like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. And if you are not already a part of this book club, please hit the Patreon link below and or the join button here on the YouTube. And for a small monthly fee of $5, you babies, yes, you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the YouTube gets it, if the YouTube gets it. Now, let's talk about Caller Miss Ross, the unauthorized biography of Diana Ross by I Do J.R.T. Do you know where you're going to? It was a question in which Florence Ballard never had an answer. Life had never gotten any better for Blondie. During one Christmas season in the early 70s, a despondent Florence took her three children to the boarded up house on Buena Vista Avenue. She was almost incoherent as she stood in front of it with her daughters at her side and talked about how wonderful it once was when they all lived in this home. She complained that now mommy can't afford no Christmas presents for her babies. Then she and her girls sat on the snow-covered front steps and pretended that they still lived there. In August 1975, Mary Wilson arranged for Florence to visit her in Los Angeles. She brought her on stage during one of the Supreme shows and the sight of Florence was heartbreaking. She had never stopped drinking and the effect of years of alcohol showed. The warmth and the softness in her face were gone, but the audience cheered loudly. Guys, you see, I just got fresh face on, pink curls, no mascara, nothing. You know, it's not that I don't love you because I love you, you know. It's just sometimes y'all know I can be a bit lazy when it comes down to getting in front of the camera because I feel like I'm in front of the camera so much. But let me tell you what Mary Wilson did, right? So they all backstage, right? And a fan had noticed that Florence, you know, was back. And the fan was startled by Florence's appearance. Flo realized that the fan was startled. Suddenly, Mary Wilson swept grandly by wearing a low-cut white sequin gown, matching turban, and a black and white feathered stole. She had a flute of champagne in her hand. Grinning, she said something to someone about how fabulous she thought she looked. It took me three hours to get my makeup to look like this. She gushed. Three hours. Can you believe it? Florence tried to ignore her. God damn it, I need a drink. She said, twitching, a double shot. That's what I need right now. The fan wished he could reach out and let her unburden her heart. Instead, he turned and walked away. It was too painful to see her like this. One of his friends caught up to him and pointed to the woman in the floral print dress leaning against the wall and asked, is that? No, it's not. 
the fan said as he shook his head and continued walking. After Florence left Los Angeles that summer of 1975, she and Mary Wilson didn't speak to each other until the following November when Mary hosted a family reunion in Detroit. Mary decided not to invite Flo to the party. Ain't this a blip? It's mighty funny to me that Mary it likes to invite people to other people's parties. Remember, Remember when Barry and Motown, they had that little, you know, get together at Barry house. And Mary was so pressed for Florence to come. And then when Florence got there, she was drunk as booty coo and pregnant, according to this book. Right. But she was so pressed to have Flo at Barry Gordy's party. You have a family reunion and you decide that you don't want Flo to go. Okay, you decide, no, I don't need her energy at my party. Okay, didn't matter because Flo came anyway. That's right, Flo. You ain't going to pick and choose when you want me around, bitch. What kind of friend are you? I talked to Diane just the other day, Florence had told a friend after she returned to Detroit in 1975. I just felt like I wanted to talk to her. So I called round and got her number in Beverly Hills and I just called her. May I speak to Miss Ross, please? Florence asked politely. Whom shall I say is calling? He atoned. Florence. Florence Ballard. Who is this really? The person on the other end demanded impatiently. Miss Ross is extremely busy and certainly has no time to dot dot dot. Just tell her that it's Florence. Suddenly, Diana picked up an extension. Blondie, my God, is it really you? Florence recalled. It was a very strange call, Diana would say years later. She said she was ready to go back to singing. The next thing I knew, she was dead. After her conversation with Diana, Florence received an unexplained cash settlement. Now that Florence had $50,000 in her bank account, her husband was back in the picture. Of course, because that's what dead nigga mattresses do. They reappear when they see, you know, a possibility of a lick. That's what, that's what they do, girl. She considered going back into show business, but confided to one friend that she still didn't know the difference between a recording contract and a management contract. She purchased a new home, paid cash for a Cadillac, and gave her children the nicest Christmas that they ever had with a huge tree and plenty of presents. Some said that she had won the lawsuit against the lawyer who had absconded with Motown's settlement money. Others insisted that money came from Diana Ross. Maybe it did come from Diana Ross, was all Tommy Chapman had to say. What the hell difference does it make? Two months later, on February 22, 1976, Florence Ballard was dead. Records filed with the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office listed the cause of death as cardiac arrest. Florence weighed nearly 200 pounds. An, autos an autopsy revealed a blood clot in a major artery. A doctor confirmed that it was unusual but possible for a 32-year-old woman to suffer a heart attack especially considering Florence's history of high blood pressure and the medication she was taking for weight loss. But I think she died of a broken heart, her mother Lurley said. It didn't last too long, Florence had said, of the supreme success. We were bound someday to go our separate ways. Diana Ross set up a trust fund for Florence Ballard's three daughters, the amount each girl will be entitled to when she turns 21 has not been revealed, but it is said to be in the six figures. Certainly, this was a generous gesture on Diana Ross's part. I wonder how them girls used that money. That's all I have to say. But then a month after Florence Ballard's death, Diana Ross told People Magazine, did I cry? Yes, I cried. She said, people tried to help Florence. I tried to help her. She had it all and then she threw it away. She quit the Supremes, but we didn't quit her. Now, yes, Motown will drive you crazy and have you around there flicking a the light switch on and off. Yes, okay? But you have to make the effort to fix yourself, or at least your surrounding supporting people have to do things to try to keep their family together and prosperous. But we know that dead nigga mattress ain't that ninja to do that. Don't make too big of a thing of this, she cautioned the supporter. 
Florence was very important in my life, but I'm not dead. She did this to herself. Rhonda Suzanne came bounding into her mother's bedroom after school one afternoon. Why is my skin brown? Why is my girlfriend's skin white with blonde hair? The five-year-old asked. Diana kneeled down to her level and smoothed down her little girl's dress. Well, kid, those are the bricks. Your skin is brown like mine. Do you think mommy's pretty? Of course. She said, well, okay, that's just what happens. Some of us are dark skin, some of us are brown skin, some of us are light skin. But it doesn't matter because we're all beautiful. Rhonda was satisfied with that, went into the living room and finished watching How They Do They. Diana seems to be an excellent mother. I like to spend as much time with them as I can, she had said. I don't mind if I spoil them by giving them a lot of love. If loving them means spoiling them, then that's just too bad. Rhonda was watching television when a commercial came on announcing the sale of a new collection of Diana Ross and the Supremes hit records. The girl sat in front of the tube with her legs crossed and a confused expression on her face as photos of the three Supremes flashed across the screen with a skinny, doe-eyed front singer mommy who is uh the diana ross diana ross responded baby i just don't know i don't know i don't know who that diana ross is of her marriage diana ross said at this time we never thought it would last this long five years but here we are shortly before chutney was born diana got up in the middle of a sleepless night and wandered into her bathroom where she began to cry uncontrollably emotionally everything seemed out of whack she said i finally told bob i wasn't happy with my career or my life or my marriage and nothing seemed to be working the way i wanted it to and yet i was feeling all this guilt because i had everything beautiful children a warm home a good job and love disgusted with diana's continued dependency on barry gordy even though he and Barry got along famously, Bob introduced her to the EST, the E-Hard Seminars Training Philosophy. Bob wanted her to realize that she was successful because of her talent, not only because of her connections with Barry Gordy. The older she became, the more she began to analyze what had brought her success in the past and what she would do in the future. Bob was tired of hearing about it. Who was responsible for her fame? Was she or was Barry Gordy? The teachers in artist development, the songwriters, the producers. Later, she told McCall Magazine, even today, I'm not sure what I was crying out for that night. When she was pregnant with Chudney, except that up to that point, I had simply been doing what I was told and letting other people think for me. I never really looked inside myself for answers or even questions. After Chudney was born, it was reported that Bob walked out on Diana. He had it with her obsession with Barry, said a friend. There was a big blow up over something Barry had said to Diana, or perhaps it was the other way around. Who really knows? Barry was always involved in their marriage, and it was impossible to keep him out of it. Despite the problems in their marriage, Diana and Bob posed for a Loving People magazine cover in January 1976. Of her relationship with Barry, Diana admitted in an article, at first, he was a dictator, and I really hated him. Then I loved him more than anything. Then I started to hate him again, and now I really like him. Later that year, Diana said of Gordy, he's in charge of my career, always has been, and always will be, but he's not the director in my life. Now more than ever, Diana seemed determined to extricate herself from Barry's Gordy's hold. One of her first moves in that direction was putting together her own nightclub act in 1976. In this new 90 minute nightclub act, Diana Ross became the ultimate glitz queen. She really knew how to give her fans who were now paying to see a movie star as well as a recording artist what they craved most. It was Mahogany Come to Life. In the summer of 1976, Diana worked at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Just before going on, she wrote on her dressing room mirror with soap, you can have it any way you want it. Her mind was apparently made up. 
Following that engagement in June while appearing at Radio City Music Hall in New York, she filed a divorce from Bob Silverstein. Yeah. Like, share to Facebook, subscribe, and visit uptopbeauty.com. Now remember this. The same people that you meet on the way up will always be the same people that you meet on the way down. My naysayers, my patron loves. You babies, y'all better have a good one. Peace.